for the sake of the plot. Hi, I'm here to discuss Either Or, the sequel to the cult classic The Idiot. Overall, I think Either Or is a very satisfying but also very challenging read. It's a very warm and generous sequel. It really delivers for like people who are invested in Saving's coming of age. You know, we we watched her struggle in her first year and you get that character that you know and you've like you feel like you know really well you get her the friends you get like a lot of familiarity you know there's a lot of humor it's fun there's all the like literature it's all the stuff you love but i feel like the themes that it's exploring are kind of intense and it doesn't come to a lot of like very clear conclusions. Um, it's subtle and it really makes you think, which is why I loved it. I feel like this book is asking, what does it mean for a young woman to narrativize her life? How do you do that? How far can you go doing that? There's a part in the back of this book that kind of like encapsulates what I'm talking about. Why do so many novels have crazy abandoned women in them? How does one live a life as interesting as a novel, a life worthy of becoming a novel without becoming a crazy abandoned woman? And all of this is within the context of a lot of greater forces that are happening in Satan's life that she's not necessarily aware of, right? Like it's in the context of like compulsory heterosexuality it's in the context of the male gaze the limits of like an aesthetic life basically after i finished this book i was really wondering if i was just like picking up on things that weren't necessarily what the book like the story was trying to convey um but i feel i kind i feel more solidified in what i think about the story and kind of where it was trying to go and I think I was right um and I got the chance to hear Elif Batuan speak in LA recently and what she was kind of talking about with her motivations for the like writing the story and kind of like what she wanted to convey did correspond with kind of like what I was thinking about so that's good um yeah I wasn't crazy like I that Basically, she was, I got what she was trying to say, <laughs> and I'll be less vague once I actually like, start getting into the video. It'll make more sense later. So yeah, I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy. So I have a crazy amount of notes. Um, I've read and watched a lot of interviews with the author. I have lots of, you know, intro to gender and feminism class knowledge. So I'm ready. I'm ready to analyze. Um, let's begin. Also, major disclaimer, this is very clearly not a spoiler-free review. I would say if you liked The Idiot, it's definitely safe to say you'll pr you're probably going to like either or. You should pick it up. Um, but if you want to like go into the book, you know, blind without any type of influence on your reading experience, I'd save this video until after you finish. New York Times called either or like, um, the witty master of the micro observation returns, like something like that. Um, and they were right. You know, the sequel to The Idiot, it is full of that humor, that wit, the like absurd adventures, and obviously the beautiful micro observations. So we're meeting Selin starting her second year at Harvard, and she's still very consumed by her past with Yvonne. But as we kind of follow her through the academic year, she starts to kind of process what happened the year before and over the summer and she kind of slowly starts to untangle herself from him and she gets back to school and all her friends are like did anything happen like you know they're asking like did your like weird obsession and like situationship with this guy like did it become like something real like did you guys sleep together that's like a huge part right of like the whole thing and she's like no and there's kind of a lot of shame of the of like feeling like she just spent her whole first year of college just like in an internal drama um that just was not externalized it's kind of like everyone is like trying to like have all these like crazy college experiences and 
I think she, Celine definitely feels like kind of left behind in that regard. Okay, maybe not left behind, but just like out of pace with her peers. And then she reads Kierkegaard's Either Or. Duh. Um, and she kind of discovers that like basically nothing is new. Other men have also manipulated young women for their own entertaining purposes. And they also wrote about it. Like, and it's that classic thing of with like Bunteman's writing where you're taking like the books that you're reading, um, that the character's reading and using it as like a way to interpret your life, right? Um, and like kind of how to process things. And basically she reads she reads these stories kind of as like an epiphany, like, okay, I relate to this. But it turns out these stories are like what it means to live an aesthetic life in the sense to like be, like to live committed to doing exactly what you want to do, seeking out your pleasures. It's like these great literary men living an aesthetic life by living as writers. And like for Satan, what she also wants to do is to be a writer. And these great literary men are living aesthetic life. So she's like, okay, well, that's it. Like forget just having an internal drama, I'm going to, I'm going to live the aesthetic life. Like I'm going to commit myself to doing whatever it takes to get all of these different types of experiences so that I can write about it. But that, that's kind of like what this, the back of the book was asking earlier. It's like, that kind of leads to a more terrifying question, which is like, what happens if you want to live an aesthetic life? but you're the young woman that's normally in these stories, right? That's the one that's being kind of like screwed over. So Satan wants to be a writer. She's determined to like experience everything all for the sake of the plot. It's very, it's this book in as few words as possible. It's all about making everything for the sake of the plot. And she's ready to do all these new things, right? Like go to parties, start drinking, having sex whatever. Specifically like sleeping with men. There's a part of the book where kind of like her, Svet Svetlana and Luxemi get closer and they get boyfriends and they grow apart and Selin and Svetlana who have such a like th that like core female friendship they talk a lot about oh Selin is leading, is leading an aesthetic life and like Svetlana is going to live an ethical life. And Satan has this like blind dedication to narrative, but as you, I feel like as the story progresses, you realize something's lost in the way. And now like Satan's new novelistic preoccupations, her new sexual freedom, they're being put to the test. And this is when in the summer she goes to Turkey and she sets out to cover um, a bunch of different places in Turkey for her college travel guidebook called Let's Go. She actually really wants to go to Russia, but they don't let her and they're like, you're gonna go to Turkey. And Selin goes through, you know, Batuman's like signature series of absurdist misadventures. She kind of makes her way through the great, the bad, the touristy, right? Like this, is where the book gets challenging. This is where her idea of living an aesthetic life is really put to a test. The second portion of the story, kind of like Batuman is taking Satan's commitment to the aesthetic life and just like throwing it in the ringer. Like, you know, let's see if you can pass these tests, kind of. While she's in Turkey, we see how everything's kind of just absurd in two specific ways. One is the absurdity of being in different places, right? It's the absurdity of being a child of immigrants, of being from one place and living in another, and then going back to that place and feeling like you don't really belong there. And this is something that Batuman talks about um, in, in interviews. I'm gonna read here. Batuman says she's attracted to the absurd moment, partially because part of this comes from being children of immigrants and being so conscious of not having a script for what is normal and not normal. I did have this feeling in my own life that my parents sacrificed a lot for me and I had opportunities that no one in my family had. I wanted to be a writer and it's churlish and babyish to say no to too many things. You should see them and do all of them. And I think this is where that idea of Selin just trying to say yes to everything 
kind of comes into play. And the second part is that it's kind of absurd, like as a young woman to try to embody the way that these like great literary men have lived, right? But Tamon kind of asks this question in a 2017 interview, I think with Lit Hub. She says, I am writing a sequel to The Idiot and it has more about sex. It's where saying yes all the time quickly becomes problematic. When does that instinct to say no actually kick in? On this trip, Satan has a lot of sexual encounters with the, with these men, right? And it's kind of hard to read it because Satan herself doesn't really know or like process what's going on. Some of them are desired, some of them not, and others honestly like it's kind of unclear. Um, and you really see how Satan wants to say yes to everything and wants to experience all of this and like experience all these new sexual encounters but it's hard to read because there are some scenes where looking back at it you can tell that like it was kind of like an unsafe or undesirable situation for her but she don't, she just like doesn't really have the the ability to kind of understand that and like what I interpret I feel like this is trying the story is kind of trying to say something about the gray area with consent I think so much for young women like their first early sexual experiences are so much of that is in the gray area it's almost hard to tell what you want like as you're going through it um, and you're still like such a young person and just like trying to even figure out like who you are as a person and like what you like and what you don't like and like what is something you want and what is something you don't want. I think in these scenes it's also kind of trying to say more subtly of like when you're a young woman trying to figure out how to live your life and like figure out what you want and what you don't want so much of that is a result of like unconsciously these larger forces that are kind of affecting or like influencing those decisions right and like satan and her friends don't really have the language to like talk about like the patriarchy and the male gaze and rape culture and like how or like the fact that those th those factors would be affecting their their own experiences and I think this kind of leads into the larger themes that are being discussed in this story in interviews that but Batman has done and also in the um, back part, like in the notes section um, of the book. She talks about the influence of Adrian Rich's text, Compulsory Heterosexuality, and um, the influence it had in writing the book. And she talks about how she read it for the first time in 2017. Um, after The Idiot came out and it really made her question why she, when she was younger, she kind of saw herself as like a literature person and not a politics person and never really questioned why there should be a distinction between the two in the first place. A lot of the motiv or like motivation for writing the story was trying to piece out why were they not drawn to the political and why they were not drawn to um, like feminism or like understanding their like instead of just using literature to understand and process their lives like why weren't they also using like feminist text and the story isn't prescriptive right like that's kind of why I was also hesitant after I finished the story and it, I really had to sit and think and I was like am I like making this up or were these sexual encounters weird or like is this what this is trying to say because it's not like Satan is like the character is like oh this was bad this was good because she doesn't have she doesn't understand it that way yet and I think it's kind of like Batman is taking the mindset and like ways of doing things in the late 90s that she experienced as a young person and like putting it in front of the eyes and mindset of readers now and kind of seeing what results in that which I think is really cool but Tumon read compulsory heterosexuality and it's kind of the gist of it is talking about the larger forces in society that draw women away from both themselves and from other women and I think that's really clear in 
like kind of what happens between Selin and, and Svetlana and like how their relationship changes in the second year. Selin and her friends like they're very concerned with becoming with like becoming adults and like becoming real people through college and part of be becoming a real person a real woman you have to be understood by men right you need to have these relationships with men and you need to emphasize them in your life and i feel like this quote on page um i think 271 kind of kind of embodies this like idea of like the male gaze that i've been talking about why was it that the thing you had to do when you saw a girl to prosecute whether and in what way she was beautiful as Lara I realized was with guys some of them were physically repellent or appealing but a lot of them initially presented as neutral and there wasn't that immediate urgent feeling cognitive puzzle to slot them in as there was with literally every female person including one's own self in windows and storefronts sometimes it seemed to me that I looked interesting mysterious sculptural other times I thought that I didn't look like anything, that nothing matched together or corresponded to anything or had any kind of grace or proportion or meaning, that the posture was deformed and hateful, like a sign of laziness or obsequeness or some other personality flaw. It's like, my heart. Uh, it's like a little too relatable. And at least like in my interpretation, as Sidon kind of goes through her second year and encounters some feminist text, she kind of basically comes to the conclusion that she doesn't really have a need for it or kind of disregards it while she's like trying to figure out all her problems. And Sidon almost has this like hesitation to embrace like feminist theory because she'd have to admit that there's like these larger forces going on and I feel like, like the time period and the like socio-cultural context that she's in admitting that you are like you don't have full control of your life or you're almost a victim and so much of what she's focused on in her second year is the idea of controlling her life there's just not a lot of like critical thought as to how what she wants can be influenced um I just thought that was really interesting and well done. It's just like, it's both like wonderful and also really hard to read someone kind of like going through that whole process. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't really a point to this review other than I just wanted to talk about <laughs> my thoughts. Honestly, this is just as good as The Idiot. I'm not gonna even compare the two of them because they're both really good in their own way. Um, but it's wonderful. You need to read it. That's, I mean, what did you expect? Like, okay, that's it. That's all I have for right now. Um, give me your controversial opinions. What did you think? Did you find this book kind of challenging? Let me know. I'd love to hear about it.